Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, these first couple of slides, Jenny already did my job, but thank you for coming out. I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing tonight, so I appreciate that. Otherwise, I would just be talking to my wife. Um, so yeah, as she said, you know, I'm, I'm actually transitioning over to Arizona now, focusing on, on metabolic health. Um, I have no financial interest in anything that I'm talking about tonight. Uh, my, my dietary uh, bias is towards low-carb keto, intermittent fasting, and we can talk about what that means. And hopefully we do a question and answer and go through you know, in detail a lot of these things. And so generally my background, I spent 18 years in general internal medicine practice. And then in 2020, right before COVID, I decided to jettison and go on my own and really focus on metabolic health and not really uh, in the insurance model. Um, I, two people sponsored my podcast, Keto Mojo. Uh, it, the, it's a product where you can check ketones and sugar levels and also Health Code, uh, it, who makes protein shakes for um, seniors and people in nutritional need. And they just pay the uh, production cost. They don't pay me at all. So basically, our, our, our plan for tonight is just understand the impact of stress, sleep, all these things that we kind of miss out on. And, and unfortunately, in the doctor's office, we rarely discuss these things learn practical tools. What do we do if we're stressed out all the time and not sleeping and our lifestyle is kind of crazy as a lot of us uh, are suffering. Um, and then just basically some other treatment modalities that we can do and what are the, the best practices and, and some practical applications of this. And then um, applying this information to a couple of case studies, some patients that I've had uh, and really just relax. If you fall asleep, I won't be upset because uh, that's what we're talking about too. So this is one thing we talk about metabolic health and a lot of people don't know what that is, but this big study they did from 1999 to 2018, they found that only about 7% of people are metabolically healthy. So that means 93% of us are, are struggling. And that's what I was really struggling. My mom's side of the family, everyone had heart attacks and strokes by the time they were in their early fifties. And I was following the ADA's recommended diet, doing everything that we were supposed to do. And I was gaining weight and I was pre-diabetic about six years ago. And so what is metabolic syndrome? This is one of our biggest associations with cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and strokes. And so they're basically these five things, high blood sugar, which is diabetes or pre-diabetes. Number two, low HDL, which is what we call the good cholesterol. High levels of triglycerides. That's another fat in the blood large waist circumference in men over 40 and women over about 36 and high blood pressure. Now, this is what we're seeing standardly in medicine. And uh, you'll notice LDL is not listed as one of them. And that's the biggest thing that we focus on all the time. But it seems like we have a lot of other things that we can be spending our time on. So really metabolic health, really what it comes down to, if you can imagine these balloons are our fat cells, what happens is as we're, when we're young, we could eat whatever we want, do whatever we want. We're active, we're playing. And so most of us don't gain weight as kids. Those of us who do as kids are probably kind of set up to have struggles as we get older. But what happens is we get this thing called insulin resistance. So what's happening is those cells start telling your body, look, I can't take any more fat or sugar into them. And, and they get so expanded. And once they get expanded, it starts releasing LDL cholesterol back into the bloodstream starts releasing a lot of inflammatory markers that, that can cause problems. So this is what we're really saying. We have to start shrinking those fat cells back down so that they're not overburdened. And we could talk about, there's some medicines that are out right now that are controversial. I would love to answer questions about that in the, the question and answer. But we're dealing with a lot of stuff when we're struggling with obesity and diabetes, addiction, stress, you know, Pavlov, we smell good food, we wanna go eat it, we don't care if we're hungry or not. You know, being lonely, depressed, anxious, and then just questioning what we're doing in life. Where, you know, what's our meaning? So the problem is so many of us come across our friends and they go, oh, I did it this way. You know, I, I went that, you have to do it this way. Here's how I did it. You know, I, I did that route or I did that route. So it's so frustrating because we, we want to know what's the right route for us individually. And generally our journey looks like this, you know, we think, okay, we're going to get on track and we're going to change this year, January 1st, we're doing this thing. And then Easter comes along. You're like, oh gosh, I want some candy. And then the in-laws and you're stressed and, you know, work stuff, Halloween candy, Thanksgiving, you know, the Super Bowl, all that kind of stuff. So it's hard to, to really um, stay on track. So the less we deviate, the better we can do in the long run. Um, does anyone recognize this guy? Okay. All good. Well, this guy's one of the, my heroes in life. And Dave's Ben Bickman. He's the head of longevity studies at BYU. And he wrote a book called Why We Get Sick. 
And he said, look, five things. And at the time I met him, I was at a medical conference. I was working 18 hour days, stressed out, getting up at four in the morning, getting home at nine at night. And uh, I said, hey, Ben, look, if I want to live a long life, what do I have to do? And I would say, if there's any take home, I would look at these five things because I have not proved these wrong with my patients or myself. Number one, manage your stress. He said, Brian, don't work 18 hour days every day. And I'm thinking, okay, what's number two? Get enough sleep. And I'm, like, I'm sleeping four, hour, four or five hours a night. I go, Ben, I don't like your rules. I'm, I'm 0 for 2 so far, and there's only five. And he said, that's why doctors die before everyone else. And that's true. Doctors die at a younger age than the, than the general population. Uh, next, uh, don't smoke or drink, right? Eat real food and exercise regularly. He goes, everything else is luck of the draw. That's what you have control over. So a lot of us right now can think about it and say, okay, I can change this. Let me work on these things. So I'm hopefully I can... I can um, convince you on some of these things. And, uh, and there's tons of data out there, and I'm actually surprised by how much data there is. But his thing is saying, hey, look, control the carbohydrates, don't eat processed food and sugar like crazy all the time. Prioritize protein, make sure you're getting enough protein for muscle mass, and that's really important. We'll find that down the road. Don't fear fat, as far as like avocados and olives and olive oil, things like that. And uh, fasting, all these things have been shown to be to help metabolic health. Really what we're trying to do is rest the mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of the cell. And if they're overstressed and overworked all the time, they burn out just like we do. Uh, really staying as insulin sensitive so those balloons don't blow up. And so this was shocking to me when I first started really looking at this. So this is in the country of Colombia. They look at everyone who had a heart attack or a stroke in the entire country. And they said, what markers can we look at from a cardiovascular risk standpoint? So if the risk ratio is a one, that means it made no difference if it was high or low. It didn't make a difference in these people who actually had heart attacks. It wasn't theoretical. So total cholesterol made no difference. So you couldn't look and say, well, they had high cholesterol, so they had a heart attack. There was no, there was no correlation. LDL cholesterol, which we all talk about all the time in office visits, made no difference in cardiac outcomes. High blood pressure doubled the risk, and I'll tell you why that does. But the elephant in the room was high insulin levels. High insulin level, almost 700% increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So the problem is no, you know, I practiced for 16 years before I checked my first insulin. And once I did, I realized every single patient who had a uh, bypass graft, multiple stents, um, uh, strokes at a young age, they all had super high insulin. Guess what? It's not a standard test that we look for. But I'm hopefully going to convince you that you go back to your doctor and say, let me just get a fasting insulin. A healthy value is less than five. I see routinely people in the 30 and 40 range, which means that your balloons are full and you're making a lot of insulin trying to shove it into the fat cells that are already full. And that's when the triglycerides start going up and the HDL drops. And also insulin, high insulin, not only does it, insulin's job, it's a hormone that helps uh, to get rid of sugar in the bloodstream. So if you eat, you drink a Slurpee right now, your sugars go straight up, your body shoots up insulin to get rid of it then it has to put it somewhere. So it's gonna put it into your fat cells or into your liver as a backup. And uh, it gets, can't stay in the bloodstream or you get diabetes. So that's kind of the, the thing with insulin. You don't want it to be high all the time, which means it's not working very well. So this is a big one. This is a, another big take home. And it was really surprising to me is we talk about, this is LDL cholesterol. Uh, has anyone, has everyone heard the term LDL? Does that make sense? Okay, I don't want, okay. So LDL cholesterol is the one we say, you want that less than 100 or so. So if you go from the LDL of 100 to 160 to 220, this is your cardiac risk going across, right? So you don't want to be in this stack. That is really bad. That's a super high cardiovascular risk. That's with a low, this is HDL, the good cholesterol. The lower your HDL is, the, biggest your car, the bigger your cardiac risk. So if I can take your HDL from 25 to 85, your risk goes from here to here. So the question becomes, if I'm worried about cardiac risk, would I rather have you have an LDL of 220 with an HDL of 85 or 90? Or would I rather have you have an LDL of 100 with an HDL of 25? No one wants to be in the big stack. So you want to be in this front row for sure. You know? And so there wasn't much difference in cardiac outcomes if your LDL was 100 or 220. But we get a high LDL and we all freak out about it, you know, because that's what we've been really, really focusing on. So again, this is another, just making that same point in women. The American Diabetes Association says that if your LDL, I mean, if, if your A1C, which is a three-month sugar average, 
It says if it's at seven, you're at goal. Well, I was like, wow, that's a 400% increased risk of cardiovascular disease. If we can get that from here down here, we've done a huge service uh, for decreasing our risk of cardiac issues and strokes and all these other things we're looking at. Because sugar is massively pro-inflammatory, and we're going to talk more about that. And this is a huge one. This is from Ben Bickman, that, that guy I showed you the picture of. This is looking at your sugar, your three-month sugar average, and your sugar they track together. So we worry about diabetes, but here's the deal. What's happening that whole time is even though if I just look at one marker and I go, oh, look, your, your three-month sugar average is normal, you're not going to get diabetes, but I don't look at the insulin level. What's happening is your, your, your pancreas is making tons of insulin trying to get rid of that extra sugar. And it's working harder and harder. And at some point, your pancreas says, I can't keep up anymore. You're, you're eating cookies all day and donuts and all that. I can't keep up. So what happens is your body loses its, its ability to make enough insulin because it's not working effectively. And what happens is your, your insulin starts dropping. As that does, your sugars go straight up. So this is insulin resistance. This is about 10 to 15 years before you get diabetes. So no one should ever get type two diabetes. I want to clarify that without knowing it for 10 years it's coming. Because what I can do is every year track this and I see insulin creep up, creep up, creep up. And I think, uh oh, that's not good. But then with our patients now, when we start focusing on lifestyle, we see the insulin coming down, 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 down and the, and the A1C is coming down. If you're over here, you're in great shape. If you're over here, you're in big trouble, right? And at some point, if anyone's ever heard of diabetic ketoacidosis, what that is, is that you lose your, you, your body stops making insulin completely. And when that happens, your sugars go astronomically high. When the high sugars are high, it knocks off the pancreas and the pancreas can't function. And so you're kind of stuck. But the, the take home message I think is when you get diagnosed with insulin, I'm, with diabetes on this day, your insulin is probably the highest it's ever gonna be. It's just not working anymore. The cells are saying, I can't take any more sugar in. And that's type two diabetes. So Ben Bickman's book shows this is that insulin resistance, high insulin is causally related, not associated, causally relates to all these things. So we could throw you a pill, you come to my office, like, oh, you have high blood pressure here. You have this problem, here you go. Instead of saying, why don't we fix this problem and see what happens to everything else? And we find that when we fix that problem, all these other problems start going away. So Rosetto, Pennsylvania, has anyone ever heard of this place? The reason I bring it up, it's a hugely important thing for us because what happened, this was in 1955, Eisenhower president has a heart attack. So everyone said, oh, heart disease is a problem. We never had this, we never had a president have a heart attack. So they started looking to see what was the root cause of his heart attack. Well, it turns out he was smoking like four or five packs a day, right? So they, they and he, he drank and he was stressed and he had all these other issues along, along the lines. Um, so they looked around the United States and they said, where's the lowest incidence of cardiac disease, heart attack, strokes, all these outcomes we're worried about. It was Rosetto, Pennsylvania, right? No one had a fatal heart attack under the age of 55 there, right? That doesn't happen anywhere. So people over 65 had half the all-cause mortality of anywhere else in the world, right? Uh, what was their secret? Were they on statins? No, it wasn't even, statins didn't even come around until 1987. This is 30 years before that. Vegan diet? No, they weren't vegan. They were Italian immigrants. So they were eating pasta, bread, rice, all this stuff. We go, yeah, it's probably not a good thing to eat, right? Um, they, they didn't change anything and they weren't even keto, right? A lot of us push the ketogenic diet. But what they found was there was uh, no difference from other talents based on their fat intake. Uh, Ansel Keys was the guy who said that saturated fat was a problem. He's since been, you know, the data has not uh, panned out to what he was trying to push. It, they were, they had obesity, they smoked cigarettes, they had high cholesterol. Uh, was it genetics? No, some of the people who left the town died of heart attacks in other towns growing up there. And they go, What's, what is it about this town? Like it's the same elevation. There was no difference between all the surrounding towns that were just a couple of miles away. And they found that these guys in Rosetto were very cohesive. They had a great sense of family bonds. They had three generations in the same house. So the parents wanted to go to dinner. They would watch the grandkids, right? And so the grandkids and the grandparents bonded. The grandparents had a purpose in life that they were helping with the grandkids. Tons of community because they were discriminated against after World War II. Um, again, they all lived under the same roof and they had civic pride. These people were the first ones to donate. If your car broke down, it's a lot like Prescott. You know, I'm from California. So being here, like everyone kind of helps out each other instead of like 
you know, running in the house and not saying hi to anyone. So all those things made a huge difference. So that's the only difference they found. They, they spent 10 years there. But and sadly, what happened is they started uh, getting more Westernized with time. And now their mortality rates the same as everywhere else. So it wasn't a genetic thing. It was really about decreasing stress. So is stress important? These are things that I would see and you go, gosh, so this is a guy, a guy who's 73 years old. I've been taking care of him for 19 years. So between, for those 19 years, he was between 180. He was never off by two pounds. This guy was super fit, never had a weight problem. This year he gained 23 pounds. This is after COVID lockdowns where the rest of us gained weight, right? So I was like, what in the world? He said, well, the lockdowns didn't really affect me because I just flew to a ranch in Texas and I was at my buddy's ranch for six months and learned about cows. And then I went to the wineries and learned about wine. He said, it didn't really affect me because he's a single guy, never had responsibility. He's retired. He, has, he doesn't have financial issues. No diet change, no exercise change, no change in his alcohol intake. So how do you be calories in, calories out? How can he be gaining 23 pounds in one year? It's ridiculous. The only difference was, uh, and also his genes aren't going to change at 72. So you can't really argue with genetic in his case. He moved in with his mom, who's 99 years old with dementia. He's waking up six times a night to take care of her. He worries about her all day. Did she leave on the stove? Did she do this? So a lot of us can identify as our parents get older that that's a huge responsibility. And that was the only difference. So we talked and I said, maybe you should think about having a caregiver stay the night a couple nights just so you can sleep. He lost 18 pounds within three months <laughs> with no other changes. So the importance of sleep, and, and hopefully I can make this uh, uh, clear. So poor attention, bad stuff in school, you know, all kinds of stuff, increased mortality, increased morbidity, all that just from sleep. Even if you're eating a perfect diet, sleep has a huge factor. Um, again, elevation of blood pressure, all these things are, are well documented. And they took Navy SEALs and sleep deprived them and stressed them out. And they started getting this insulin resistance or insulin started going up. So the rest of us are sitting ducks if we don't watch that. Um, a huge in indicator of future coronary disease and diabetes. And um, uh, this other study with 5,500 people said that they were 66, uh, 60 times more, 66 percent more likely to have hypertension than those people who slept more. So people who have hypertension, a lot of times don't sleep well, they're stressed, they have a tough job, they're having marital problems, all these things. The, the sad part about medicine is it's become so quick and so cookie cutter is the doctor has eight minutes and they're not going to say, how's your marriage? How's life? How's your stress level? They don't have time to talk about that because they're like, here's a pill. Here you go. Come back in, in three months. Uh, just hot loss of half a night's sleep uh, it can raise blood pressure. It has a huge effect on stress hormones. So poor sleep increases sympathetic. Sympathetic nervous system is when you have to this fight or flight thing. So if a lion's trying to catch you, you have to run away and get away. So when that's activated all the time, it raises your sugar because your body is trying to give you more sugar so that you can run away and get out of that scary situation. So again, you know, I don't want to belabor the point too much, but you can see sleep deprivation increases markers that we know cause cancer, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, and coagulatory factor. So people are more likely to have heart attacks and strokes when they're stressed. It slows glucose metabolism, so our sugars go up. We can't burn off sugar as well. Um, increases hunger hormones. So we're hungry all the time when we're stressed. How many people are stress eaters, right? We just stress eat. Um, but if we can get that stress under control, does that mean we don't stress eat as much? And then leptin, the, these, these hunger hormones, um, and then alters growth hormones, testosterone, all the female sex hormones, all that kind of stuff. And cortisol, that's a huge one. We could talk more about that. So again, just not sleeping at the right time. You know, computer guys who stay up till three in the morning, even if they sleep eight hours, they don't have recovery like other people. If you look at the night nurses at the hospitals, they gain weight way faster than the people who work the day shift. And it's not just because they're, you know, they're, they're eating donuts every night, but part of it is that because they're trying to stay awake. So they're snacking more to, to keep their, themselves alert. Um, but you increase your energy intake by uh, about 300 calories a day just from sleep deprivation alone. And I'm happy to see these studies because I told my wife when I was in residency, I said, I swear there's got to be something. When we're on call all night, I, not just me, everyone wants to eat all day the next day, right? You're exhausted and tired and like you, you could eat all day and you think you're never going to you know, get satiated from that. So, and again, you, you lose your, your ability to really think about what am I going to eat? And when you're really tired, you go, forget it. I'm going to happy hour and I'm eating, right? So again, this whole thing that we burn less energy, uh, night shift, people have way worse troubles because uh, they, they can't concentrate. They're having uh, more fatigue. And the, the problem is the more fatigued and tired, the more stressed we get, that feeds back and we can't sleep. And we can't, you know, and then the stress gets worse. Then you get worse. 
Um, alcohol does the same thing. It really interferes with sleep cycles. And, and there's tons of data on that too. So when we're stressed, we drink more and then our sleep gets messed up and then we get into that big cycle. So um, overweight adults, um, calorie restriction, and this is interesting. So if we calorie restrict, and, and actually just this week, Ben Bickman, of course, released this study. So he didn't, he, he posted the study, but it was showing that if you're calorie deprived and sleep deprived, a majority of your weight loss is muscle mass. And that is not good, right? So you can do everything right and be sleep deprived and you're burning muscle. Cortisol, its job is to raise sugar. So what it does, it says, okay, there's not enough energy. I'm tired, I'm stressed. Let me break down muscle and make sugar. That is a bad trade-off as we'll talk about. The biggest indicator of longevity is muscle mass as we get older. So again, uh, uh, again uh, excess daytime sleepiness, increased obesity rate and sleep apnea. You have sleep apnea, it's hard to get out of that cycle because you're always exhausted. 25% of the pay, uh, population has insomnia and, or sleep problems. And again, these are associated with cardiovascular disease, increased infection risk, um, cancer risk, and uh, depression. 50% uh, uh, decrease in immune response. So if you're sleep deprived, they give people flu, flu vaccine, they have less of an immune response to that. Um, and again, increased inflammatory markers, autoimmune disease, all these things come with poor sleep. So Again, the, I don't want to belabor the point too much, but increased risk of lung cancer, colorectal cancer, all these things we worry about, breast cancer, prostate cancer. So we're all stressed out. And so when you, when you, if we can get stress under control, all the rest of medicine becomes easy because sleep gets better, you know? And we have someone here who was just talking about that last night. As a matter of fact, we had a Zoom meeting talking about it. when I got my sleep right, then I wasn't craving food as much. And then I felt like exercising. And then I wasn't as grumpy with people. And I didn't have as much conflict. All these things connect together. And again, four, four times increased risk of uh, depression if you're sleep deprived. And with police, they had more visceral fat, which is a precursor to uh, diabetes and, and uh, cardiovascular disease. So the average police officer, the stat I read, was they, they die within two years of retiring because of all that stress they've been through, all those stress and bad sleep and all those things, it, it, that's pretty tragic. Um, and again, obesity increases the risk of depression by 55%. And if you're depressed, it increases your risk of getting obese by 58%. So that's not a good combination. So it's not that just people are depressed because they're obese. They could have been depressed way before that. So it's not that it's, it's a chicken and egg type thing. And again, diabetics have way higher incidence of, of uh, depression. And we know that poorly controlled diabetics um, have a huge, uh, a, a huge correlation with um, depression, but they didn't know why, which was first. So what they found was poorly controlled sugar preceded the depression. So it was the poor metabolic health that led to the depression and not the other way around. And again, this, uh, this, this sympathetic nervous system, this being in stress mode, like, uh oh, I gotta be here, I, I have this meeting. And not even that we're stressed, it's that our brain never shuts down. Um, again, the more stressed you are, the worse peripheral vascular disease you get. And it has to do with all these stress hormones. And again, high insulin levels. Again, the, all these things kind of come back together to a hormonal basis of, of um, cancer and metabolic disease. Um, again, uh, increased risk of, of uh, depression. Interestingly enough, when if you have high insulin for a long time, you you get depressed. But guess what? When you eat that cookie or you don't donut, you get this feeling good for a few minutes. But you, then you need three donuts, five donuts, ten donuts to get that same effect. So people who are healthy metabolically, they go, "Yeah, I have half a cookie and that's good. I don't need more." Other people are like, "I'm gonna eat them all if they're there." You you know, and that has to do with where we are metabolically. And again, deep brain. The more we sleep, the better we metabolize sugar. And so. I'll ask you, what's, what's the most, for those of us trying to change our lifestyle, you know, what's the most dangerous place? We always think of that fast food place and all that stuff, which is true. That's not good. But when you look at the data, the most dangerous place is home. Like if we're, or if we're stressed at home and we're depressed at home and we're fighting why, it, there's triggers everywhere. Like someone, you know, I'm upset. I'll go to the fridge. I'll grab something to eat. You know, I'm bored. Go to the fridge. There's a commercial on, trigger me to go to the fridge. Stressors, you know, arguments, like I need a cookie to deal with you today. Um, and then relaxing after a hard day. It's like, I worked hard today. I deserve to have a cookie. I deserve to have a glass of wine, right? Or three glasses of wine, whatever it may be. Uh, so I have a 76 year old lady who was having massive addiction to granola of all things. And she threw herself into diabetes at 76. You're like, holy cow. And so whenever she got home, 
Well, what happened is she was on, she, she had a death in her family. She was gone for a week, did not eat granola one time while she was there. She came home that night. She got home and went straight and got granola. And she's like, I'm a failure. I'm like you went a whole week without it. What triggered you? What was that thing? She goes, I knew it was available and I was stressed out. Right. And that's my comfort. Um, one of my guys lost, he's from Arizona. As a matter of fact, he lost 23 pounds while on vacation in Europe. He's a professor. Uh, and so how do you lose 23 pounds in Europe? First of all, the food's different. Second of all, he didn't have his stress. Third of all, he was away from his home. He got home. He gained eight pounds in 10 days, right? Because the fridge was there. He goes, I was bored. I was like, what's in the fridge? Open the fridge, open the fridge, right? Um, he went to visit his friend in Texas and lost seven pounds the following week. How do you do that? He goes, I was embarrassed. I didn't want to go eat if he wasn't eating. So I was just doing what he did, <laughs> right? So he changes what he was doing just based on what his friend was doing. So this is a huge one. This is one that I'm embarrassed to say for years of practice, I never really truly appreciated the impact. It's called the ACE questionnaire. I actually had the pleasure of interviewing this doc. He actually called me out of the blue because I, I said, I'm, your study is amazing. But he's with Kaiser in California, in San Diego, as a matter of fact. And ACE, ACE is adverse childhood events. So you go, what does that have to do with us now? So well, it's a series of 10 questions and they're basically just to boil it down for the sake of time. Did, were, were, did, did you come from a divorced family? Was there abuse? Were you physically or sexually abused? Were you neglected? Did they say you're not as smart as your brother? Did you grow up you know, not knowing if you're gonna be able, be able to eat? Was food like the, the only celebration time you had? You know, or you're sad and you turned to cookies to, to get over your the violence? Poverty, you know, think of the inner cities. And so what are the implications? There's a significant link between these adverse childhood events and obesity, diabetes, cardiac disease, cancer all these things. And what it comes back to is the sympathetic nervous system. We're always on this, this panic mode, this fight or flight mode all the time. And so women with ACEs with a high score on this from childhood um, were seven times more likely to be raped as an adult or have uh, abuse going on, uh, abusive relationships. So this is a huge, huge factor. So it's not like you just say, okay, I had a bad childhood, move on. You have to deal with those things. It also correlates with health, health outcomes. 67% of people have at least one, and one in eight of us um, have four or more. And four or more increases the risk of all these things, right? Suicide rate goes up 12 and a half times. The, the risk of depression is four and a half times higher than the general population. If you have seven or more, you have triple the, the lifetime risk of lung cancer. Childhood events, lung cancer, right? And it's crazy because you have this overdrive all the time, this stress mode that everyone's out to get you. So three and a half times more likely to have ischemic heart disease. So maybe this was what Rosetto was doing. They didn't have so much of this because they took care of each other. They didn't have these, this, all this drama and, and stress. And, and you know when we're dealing with stress at work, we bring it home with us. We tend to. Um, six or more of those positive answers in childhood decreases your lifespan by 20 years. I don't know of anything else that does that besides smoking, maybe. And smoking is highly correlated with that too. So a lot of people who are chronically smokers, drinkers, all these things, you go back to this in childhood. If you have six or more of those, you're 4,600 times more likely to, to attempt suicide. So that is, uh, it's unreal, you know? And this population that was in San Diego County, they were not the inner cities. It's way worse in the inner cities. But this is the average age was 57, 70% uh, Caucasian, 70% were college educated. And this is their story. And so what happened is, and the reason he did this study is he was seeing who was failing out of Kaiser's weight loss program. It's a terrible program. It was all uh, liquid diet stuff, but people would lose weight and then they would just lose it and they would go and they would gain all their weight back. One of the biggest indicators of weight gain after weight loss from his study was a female who lost more than 60 or 80 pounds had someone say, wow, you look great. You look attractive. And then they went home and binged that day and they couldn't get out of that spot because they didn't want to be noticed they, they were doing it for their health not to be noticed. And so that was a huge thing. 50 times more likely to have asthma, you know? And so they looked at this over two years and they found that if they address these things, they'd have a 35% decrease uh, reduction in primary care visits, 11% reduction, just from addressing the stress and anxiety in kids. Billion dollar savings for this huge organization. They declined it. Because the doctor said, you know what? We're not social workers. We're doctors. We get pills. We don't talk about these things. And you wonder why our system's a disaster, right? This is part of the reason I left the system and went to where I can spend more time with my patients because we have to address these things because the pill is not going to fix the abuse that you went through. So it's like this. The way I explain it is like your, your car alarm is set to sensitive. So your car alarm is going off all day and you keep running out to check your car. It's like, oh, it's windy out there. 
Other people know it's windy and they're not stressed about it, but you're in a stress mode. So this is what happens. People either turn into an opossum, you know, where they just don't deal with anything. They just shut down, go and watch TV and listen to, you know, kids will do that. College kids, they just go away and don't deal with the world, play video games all day. Or you become like the gazelle or a deer when they're freaked out all the time and everything's like they're on edge. Or you could be like a lion and they don't really care what's going on around. They go, okay, no one's messing with me today, right? So, you know, that makes a big difference in outcomes. So stress, 80% of primary care visits are stress-related. And I thought this was crazy when I read it. And now I think it's probably underestimating. You know, you're stressed all the time. You get migraines, you get headaches, you get job pain, you get, all, you know, high blood pressure. All these things we're talking about, they're all, they all come back to that. And again, 80% of patients with autoimmune disease uh, uh, talk about a, a life stress within three weeks of that onset of symptoms. And you go, wow. That's crazy, right? Because your immune system gets so revved up. It's trying to, it's trying to save you, but then it gets overdone. Um, the most common time to have a heart attack is Monday morning, going to a stressful job. You know, you have a psychology. Everyone I taught you here loves it. So I was like, you guys are, it's great. When people love to be around the people they work with. I mean, that's pretty dang rare. You should be like really, really blessed by that. Um, again, strokes Monday morning. And also um, uh, during the holidays, a lot of people, because you have to deal with the brother-in-law who voted different than you or whatever, you know, and you're eating bad stuff and you're stressed and you're trying to get everything done and you're outside of your normal zone. So stress is the elephant in the room, you know, work, work stress, just to hammer this point home, uh, high, highly increased risk of cancer. So what they came up with work stress is associated with all these things, lung cancer, colorectal cancer, esophageal cancer, overall cancer risk goes up if you're in a stressful work environment. So this is my patient who I know is going to have struggles with getting their sugars under control and, and uh, losing weight. I got three kids. I'm too busy. I don't have time to talk. I can't prepare my meals. I, I'm just uh, like on edge all the time. I don't know. I never get downtime. So that's what we think about. And then, you know, this is pretty big work stress. You know, this guy's like, if he messes up, these guys are going to shoot him. But most of us aren't in that situation, but the situation was like this, we're at work and like everyone needs something from us. I need this paper tomorrow. I need this done. And so, oh, I got to, my, my, my husband's having problems at home and my kid's, you know, sick. And so these are the, the stressors that, that build up. And so even the indie guys know, you know, for 18 years of my career, I was like this, I was on the gas full speed and you did realize I got to slow down for the turns. These guys slow down for the turns. <laughs> they, they don't say full accelerate because, or they go crash. The rest of us go and crash and burn. So these people do so well, they just go, you know what, I'm not going to worry about life. I'm going to go out and look at the river and lakes and have a good time. And so this is something that I use a lot in my practice. It's called the continuous glucose monitor. It's a little thing. It's about the size of a, uh, a nickel and you can put it on the back of your arm and it measures your sugar 24 seven. This is great. If someone's not eating a lot of sugar and candy, this is like a perfect tracing. So here's my patient who's diabetic and she, we got her diabetes under great control. She's a, a nurse practitioner. And you can see her sugars are running around 100 or so. You know, this is on Thursday. Here's the same patient on Saturday. So I'm like, what the heck? I mean, there's nothing that really makes your sugar baseline go up 80 or 90 points and sit there straight across. And I said, well, what happened here? It went straight up. And then after that, it came straight down. And the next day, it was below this red line. I said, what in the world did you eat? I mean, I can't think of anything that would do that. And she said, I didn't eat that day. I was fasting all day because I was so stressed because... I had to give a talk, right? And I guarantee if you look, check my sugars right now, they're way higher than they were an hour ago, right? When you get, even if you're excited and fired up about stuff, your sugars go up. Exercise will do that. But this shows, this is a cortisol response. So when we're fighting that and you're stressed and tense, you might as well be eating cookies all day because that's where your sugars are going to be in the diabetic range. And I see this all the time. And again, this is another one, you know, this, hap this is the same week. It just happened to be. But this is one of my guys who is a CEO of a major corporation. High, he's not a high stress guy, but he's always going. He gets five calls at dinner, you know, text. He's got to take care of this. He's putting out fires all the time. So this is his normal, this bottom one here. Just, just I wanted you to see a comparison. This is what he was the week before. And he was kind of plateaued on weight loss. And he was, you know, he's doing fine, but his sugars were at a good level. But then I see this and I'm like, what in the world is he doing this week? So his sugars go crazy like that. The next day I'm looking, he has a, that big spike in the middle. Next day, another big, this big spike was from exercise. When he worked out, he released sugar so that his muscles can burn it. This is why exercise is so important. So that's not a bad thing. His insulin goes low, but this one wasn't good. I'm like, what did you do? And he said, oh, 
I got there. We flew in. Like he went to see his grandson. His gra- his first grandson was born. So he goes, guys, don't call me for ten days. I'm going to be with my family. I'm going with my wife. We're going to do dumb stuff and tell stories about high school and all that kind of stuff. So that's what he did. But he said we got there late and all the restaurants were closed. So he goes, let's just get Taco Bell. He goes, it even tastes good. And I got this stupid Taco Bell and then chips and salsa. And then this is the exercise. Then he had dinner and dessert with his family. Uh, I can't repeat his language, but this is biscuits and gravy and vegetables and an egg and potatoes. It went to 256. And he's like, uh oh, I'm not doing that again. And then, and he could see this in real time. Then he had dinner that night with his family, a little dessert. Next day, bacon, eggs, and avocado looked no spike. There was no sugar in that. His sugars did nothing with that. They actually came down during the day. And then he was good all day. Then he had a protein burger wrapped in lettuce. And they said, oh my gosh, it's your last night in, in New Mexico. They have the best sweet potato fries there. So he goes, ah, shoot, I had that. And his sugars went up. So what happened to this guy? 10 days vacation away from his stressful job. He didn't do hard workouts. He just did that one workout that you saw. Spent time with his wife and kids, laughed more than usual. Net gain, weight gain, how much did he gain in 10 days? He lost 8.8 pounds. <laughs> he lost 8.8 pounds. Why? He dropped his cortisol on his straight heels. I just wasted time. I didn't, we just played cards. We didn't do anything worthwhile. So maybe we need to do more of that, wasting time and just looking at the stars or do whatever you're going to do, right? So this is a huge take home, oxytocin. Has, has anyone ever heard of that? Oxytocin? Yeah, you know it all. Yeah, I'm going to bring you. You can just come give the talk. That's awesome. No, but oxytocin, that's the feel-good uh, hormone. When you're in love, oxytocin goes up. When you, when you get a raise, oxytocin goes up. You get a massage, oxytocin goes up. DHEA is a precursor to oxytocin. So to make the point with this whole thing with cortisol, oxytocin is the light switch. So if your oxytocin, oops, if your oxytocin is low all the time, it goes to cortisol. Oxytocin is saying, so the stress level is telling you your oxytocin, high or low. If you're stressed, intense, and worried, your oxytocin goes low. You don't, you don't enjoy life. You're just kind of surviving all the time. So that's telling your body bad times are coming. There's going to be a famine, drought. You're not going to be able to, to you know, pay all your bills. So it says, okay, don't spend money. I'm going to give you cortisol. It's going to break down muscle, release more sugar for you. So you have sugar to run on, right? Because you're going to run out of money, so I can't let you store more in the bank. You're going to take it out of the bank and use it here. So the problem becomes when your cortisol is high all the time, it blocks you from going to this side of the equation. And I'll explain what that is. But high cortisol has been highly correlated with visceral fat. That's the fat around the organs. Believe it or not, the love handles, the stuff that that jiggles that you can touch that we don't like to see, doesn't cause increased mortality, increased cardiac risk. It's the visceral fat. Once the subcutaneous fat fills up, especially in postmenopausal women, it goes to visceral fat, which is the pro-inflammatory, pro-atherosclerotic stuff. So if we can minimize the visceral fat, people do better. So visceral fat influences appetite. The more visceral fat, the hungrier you are, the more depressed you are. All these inflammatory markers I've been harping about go up with increased visceral fat. This visceral fat means all those balloons are full. Now you can't oxidize it very well. You can't get rid of that fat. It's really hard. Because when you think about it, when someone's 400 pounds, how is it possible that they're hungry all the time? It's like they have so much energy on their body, but this high insulin, blocks you. It's a fat storage hormone. So you cannot get to your fat stores when your insulin's high. Ben Bickman has shown this over and over in his lab. Then he, he puts fat cells inside butter. They don't grow. You put it inside a sugar solution, doesn't grow. You drop in insulin, they get fat in, in, in the lab. So this is exactly what happens to us too. Uh, increased risk of diabetes, cardio, all these bad things, high blood pressure, salt retention, swelling in your feet, all those things come from visceral fat. High, highly correlated with all these things with cardiac disease and, and diabetes. So visceral fat is the marker. So some, I'm telling you, I have patients who are 400 pounds. They have normal cardiac markers, normal everything, because they have a ton of storage units to put fat in subcutaneously. Other people of Indian and Asian descent can weigh 130 pounds and have type 2 diabetes. And it's mind-blowing because it's not that we're fat, we get diabetes. It's that we run out of fat storage. And so people of certain ethnicities just can't store enough fat and they get type 2 diabetes very easily. But it's the visceral fat that's causing it. Not So if you adjust for visceral fat, and I'll show you a couple of slides of that just to make that point. Again, subcutaneous fat is, is protected because you can sub that extra sugar and all whatever in there and get it out of the bloodstream really quickly. Um, yeah, some of these things have to do with, you know, people who died of COVID had this thing called TRIP-BR2. TRIP-BR2 comes from visceral fat alone. So rats, if they blocked TRIP-BR2, they couldn't kill it with COVID. They, they didn't get the, the massive inflammatory response that we see in the metabolically sick. It has to do with overwhelmed uh, uh, mitochondria and energy stores. 
So brain gut, I won't get too much into this, but this is going to be the cutting edge of medicine. It is the cutting edge of medicine. There are data now. I just did a podcast. I would highly recommend it. Sabine Hazen, who all she does is gut microbiome. And so that's the bacteria that's in your gut. You hear about probiotics and prebiotics and all that kind of stuff. But um, there's a huge, there's a huge uh, um, disruption of the, the gut microbiome with obesity, diabetes, processed food intake, and it kills off the good bacteria called the phytobacterium. That's 95% of our immune system. If that goes away, we're in big trouble. So people who live on a ranch, they are calm. Their bifidobacterium is super high. So the, the lowest mortality in the United States was, it was kind of like, I know it's, it's the, uh, the Amish. Like they weren't dying of COVID. <laughs> First of all, they kind of stuck to themselves, but their microbiome, if you look at it, was unbelievably good. These, these Maasai warriors in Africa, you go to places away from processed food and their gut microbiome is 100% different than ours. And again, this goes back to this early childhood trauma is that was mom stressed when she was pregnant? You're way more likely to be obese and diabetic and have cardiovascular disease. Did mom eat a lot of processed food? You're more likely, like, likely to have cardiac disease. C-section versus vaginal. Vaginal birth, you get mom's microbiome and you're less likely to have all these problems. Breastfed versus bottle fed. Breastfed does way better in the outcomes from obesity, diabetes, cardiac disease, metabolic health. Trauma, stressful thing, I've, I've already made that point. Just antibiotic use alone. If you were a kid and you took antibiotics for ear infections recurrently, way more likely to have obesity and diabetes when you get older. And I've seen people, I, I have a, a, a patient who was a, he's, she's a police officer. She was thinner and you'll get pictures of her entire life. She was thin, 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 never gained weight. And then four years ago, she gained like 80 pounds in a year. I'm like, what happened? Did you go through a divorce? You got stressed, what happened? She's like, I got an intestinal infection and they put me on like six months of antibiotics. And ever since then, I gain weight, I can't lose it, right? That's a common story, way more common than we believe. And then again, is food, uh, you know, poor sleep, all these kind of stuff that we've already hammered home. And again, stress screws up the lining of the, the colon, the, the mucus layer. And when that gets messed up, it all, all the bad toxins that are in the colon absorb into your bloodstream. They call that leaky gut syndrome, which a lot of us in Western medicine laughed at for a lot of years. But now there's no question about it causing autoimmune disease and, and, and marked and inflammation. Chronic stress, uh, again, uh, triggers autoimmune disease. And so this is just a study, just a, like, just a quick overview of this. So they took mice and they split them into two groups. One group were the ha happy mice. They put them in like Bob Marley land, right? They're in, on the beach, relaxed, and they have all the cheese they want. There's no cats around. They're just having a good time laying in the sun, listening to Bob Marley in the background. The other guys, they put them in where they're stressful. Cats, lightning storms, they're not sleeping. So all the stuff we're talking about. And, you know, my, mouse traps everywhere. And so then they said, okay, let's bring them back together and see what happens. And so they gave them this thing called uh, DSS. And so what it does is causes colitis. Guess what? None of the, health, the happy mice that were not stressed got it, not one. Every single one of the stressed out mice got colitis with this, with this. So they go, oh my gosh, what is it? So they went and they looked at the colon. They looked at all the different markers. What they found is they took some microbiome out of the because the, the sick one, their microbiome looked like weeds. So they took out their microbiome and gave it to a healthy one, and it got colitis. And they took a healthy microbiome from the, the one that, that was healthy, gave it to a sick one, and it got healthy. And then they took the healthy ones, and they put them on high-dose antibiotics for a week. They all got colitis afterwards. So it just tells you there's something to this. And again, stress screws up the microbiome and the gut lining. Daily vinegar, some people really benefit from that. Tons of studies and with college students that their depression scores went down just by adding in vinegar. And it has to do with some people's gut microbiome cannot make that the acetic acid very well. Um, so back to the oxytocin, if we're, if, if we're doing well, so that we already know if we're stressed out and tense, everything gets screwed up. And your body says, look, I'm not going to let you get pregnant because if you get pregnant, you don't have enough energy to take care of the kid. But one of those, I say, you just got a huge pay raise. I just tripled your pay. Everything's great, right? Now all of a sudden you say, you know what? I can go buy new shoes. I can spend money now. I don't have to conserve everything. So metabolic rate goes up. Cortisol blocks thyroid function. Why? Thyroid increases metabolic rate. If you're stressed all the time, you block your thyroid. Boom, hypothyroid. So a lot of women are on T4, which is synthroid. But if you're making T4 and it can't convert because of cortisol, you have very low T3. Your TSH looks fine, which is the, the thyroid stimulating hormone. So we're finding if we check the T3 and stress out people, we replace that, everything starts getting better. Uh, cholesterol gets better. LDL will drop 100 points easy with that alone. Uh, and, and again, you don't want to make muscle when, you're, when you don't have enough energy. So oxytocin is saying, hey, everything's good. 
you can you can keep cable cortisol saying you got to you got to stop thinking you're wasting too much energy so people get mentally foggy they can't remember things so shifting it over this way test i mean testosterone progesterone help put on muscle mass helps with metabolic rate all those things putting on muscle mass right um oxytocin this is ridiculous i just wanted to make the point this is what oxytocin is good for I'll lose my voice saying all these things, but it's ridiculous. Like if we had it, um, and this is the sad part, reduces IBS, reduces stress, reduces everything. So it's looking at the ocean or going out to the lake for a walk. Like you get all these benefits from that. <laughs> Antioxidants lowers those tumor markers we were talking about, you know, decreases your risk of, of uh, strokes, heart attacks, everything. And then it, improve bone density, improve lean, like no one, there's no one around who goes, I don't want those things, right? So this improves all those things, helps with weight loss, insulin sensitivity, all these things we're talking about, increases uh, fats, uh, energy uh, demands, all those kind of things. You think, wow, this is pretty wild that we can, uh, uh, beta cell function, that's what makes the insulin. It, it makes good insulin, not this garbage that we're making. So I read about 60 studies looking at oxytocin and guess what, they all stay at the end. If pharma could only figure out a drug that can raise the oxytocin levels, like, okay, why don't you just go, do stuff you enjoy. That's going to raise it. You know, go and be nice to people. Don't have conflict all day. So these are all the things. And exercise, I say it's useless, except if you care about these things. And it's kind of like oxytocin. It's all this stuff again. You know, increases, it, it, it makes everything better. So it's not just about weight loss. Here, I'll, I'll go back so you can kind of just take a glance. But exercise does all this stuff. So it's not just that you have to work out to lose weight. Exercise helps with the testosterone, the stress hormones, it lowers insulin, lowers cortisol. There's all the, everything we want. Skeletal muscle, the lower skeletal muscle mass you have, the more likely you are to get diabetes. That's the bottom line. So uh, again, the more muscle mass you have, the better off you do. So this is what I was talking about before. You can't just look at someone and see. So this guy on the left side, super skinny guy, this is his visceral fat, which is our big marker for cardiovascular disease. This is a disaster waiting to happen. This guy's a big muscle guy. He looked like he looked like this guy's gonna have a heart attack first, but look, he has no visceral fat. This guy's insulin is gonna be fine. His cortisol is gonna be good. All that. This guy's a disaster waiting to happen. So you can't just say, well, my friend was healthy and he had a heart attack. Well, sometimes we don't know. You have to know the, the triglycerides, HDL, all those we talked about at the beginning. Oh, I think it went back. All right. So mindset again. We have about, this is how many thoughts we have. Guys probably have a lot less than women, I'm sure. But 85% uh, of our thoughts are negative, believe it or not. 95% of those recur every day. So we're not helping our situation, right? So some of us have a fear of scales and cameras. Like we see that and go, okay, I'm going to hide behind the podium. I don't want to be seen. And so, you know, all those things are hard to deal with. It's a mindset thing. Like this guy, uh, does anyone know who this is? Are there any runners here? This guy's name is Roger Bannister. In 1954, right before Eisenhower had his heart attack, he broke the four minute mile. They said it could never, ever, ever be done. So he did it. So he held the record for 46 days. Then it got broken again. And then as of 2022, about uh, 1800 people have broken that before they say it couldn't be done. So mindset, Mike Tyson, they didn't even bet whether he'd win or lose. It was about what round are they going to knock him out? How, how many seconds it was going to take? Cause no one could touch this guy. And then this guy was a 40 to one underdog came Buster Douglas, um, knocked him out. After that, Mike Tyson was never the same, right? He knew he could be beat and everyone else knew they could beat him now. Like it can be done. So this mindset, does gratitude matter? <clears throat> Grateful people report higher life satisfaction. They just do better. Like people who are just going, yeah, things are pretty good. I can't complain. You know, and I see patients like that. They just go, yeah, I broke my arm, but oh, well, you know, someone else has a, a, a splinter and they're like, well, they can't work for a month. So again, uh, high level of, of health, they do better. Like just being grateful. Those are things just counting your blessings, those kind of things. Those things lower that interleukin-6, all those things that we've been talking about cause cancer and, and, and are tribute to all these things. Increases your HDL. So guess what? These are, these are all beneficial things. Lower risk of drug, alcohol, drug abuse, less addictive stuff because you're content. You don't need all that stuff. You know, Mark Twain, I love this quote. You know, he said, don't just sit there and worry, be proactive, do something, do anything about what's worrying you. Don't just sit there and complain about your job all the time, do something about it so you can gain information, focus, and control over the situation. I've suffered a great many catastrophes in life. Most of them never happened, right? Because all of us are thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to happen. We're going to, you know, all these bad things, disease X is coming, and, you know, you can hide or, you know, worry about earthquakes and all that kind of stuff. So this is a, a good study that was showing loneliness. And we're getting close to the end. 
But uh, what about loneliness? It's a leading predictor of all cause mortality, right? So that's why when we locked our seniors down and they couldn't have, they couldn't see people's faces, they had masks on, no contact, they couldn't play bingo. It had a massive effect on patients. It was, un I've never seen anything like it in my career. Um, lack of social connection, increased the odds of death by 50%. Increased risk of mental, you know, metabolic disease, all these things we're talking about. Screws up your mitochondria, you don't get good energy, you can't focus, you can't think. Um, again, in, in 2021, about half of patients uh, half of adults felt lonely. Um, uh, again, it causes this HPA axis, hypothalamic pituitary axis gets screwed up with that. Um, again, this sympathetic overdrive, all these things we're talking about. So um, marriage, you know, people who are married, have kids, they do better. Um, increased risk of, of loneliness in males, um, workaholics and people in poor health. So again, adolescents, 80% of adolescents, adolescents say they're lonely. That's pretty surprising, even more than seniors, which is about 40%. Uh, increased risk of, uh, you know, all these things we're talking about over and over again. Um, more likely to go to jail, more, more likely to, to take drugs and do all these things. So, you know, just saying, hey, how are you doing? Checking in with a kid, you know, that makes a huge difference in the long run for everyone. And again, hyperglycemia, all these pro-inflammatory, all the same stuff. It's like reinventing the wheel on all this stuff because that's just what it is. So is there any hope for us after all this? So remarkable effect of groups, like just coming, the fact that you just come and hear a lecture and you go, okay, I want to learn something new because you could be watching Judge Judy reruns right now, right? So hopefully there's something of value and you go, okay, just being around people and saying uh, pro-social activities, uh, you know, meetup groups, clubs, you know, if you like to ride bikes, ride bikes, find something you enjoy and go and do it. That's what Rosetto did. That's what they were doing. They were saying, you know, 85% of people in Rosetto were in a social club, church, uh, bocce ball, whatever. And I'll show you a couple of those guys. And again, self-reflection, counting your blessings, writing things down, you know, journaling, even if someone's a jerk and you write it down and you never do anything with it, that helps you too, just to get rid of that. Um, just breathing, yoga, yoga, meditation, prayer, all these things that are just so hocus pocus. It does, there are definitely data on this stuff. Um, Self-compassion, just give yourself a break. Sometimes if you eat that cookie and just go, okay, I had a cookie, big deal, right? I'll, I'll do better tomorrow. Massage, exercise, you know, um, you know, all these things, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, Again, interactions with pets, endurance, exercise, all these things are beneficial. All these things um, avoid chronic overnutrition, like eating all the time, constantly being snacking. Because we shouldn't have to eat all the time. We should be able to at least, like most of us who are older grew up, we had breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They go, don't spoil your dinner. Don't eat snacks. And then, then they go, you have to snack or you're going to die, right? Six times a day, the AD, uh, American Diabetes Association, it's insane what we're doing. So ketogenic diet, fasting, all these things have been shown to be beneficial for, for decreasing these risks, right? Support group, counseling, you know, maybe um, even a lecture here, you have a pie. Um, you know, burning your bridge. Sometimes we always think burning your bridge is bad. These guys in the Spanish Armada, they burned all their ships. They go, okay, we're either going to win or we're dying. That's it. We don't have a choice. So a lot of us go, oh, I'm going to try this diet. Okay, uh, no, I'm not going to do it. It's too hard. And so if you go, look, I'm all in. I'm doing this thing. People do better. And there's data on that. And some of the, the practical things we can do, sauna has been shown to decrease risk of, of cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke. That increases nitric oxide, which opens up the coronary vessels. Um, and, and there's tons of study in, studies in the Scandinavian countries decreasing risk of all these cardiovascular disease, COPD, heart failure, um, pulmonary disease, arthritis, headaches, immune function gets better. So, you know, 15 minutes. It's a stress. I thought stress was bad, doctor. Acute stress is good. Chronic stress is bad. So if you get acute stress, your body says, oh, I can calm you down from that. So exercise is a stress. After exercise, everything comes down. Sugars, cortisol, everything gets better after that. Improves immune function. And these crazy guys that jump in cold water, there's data on this that, you know, the stress of that, like people like who do that, they go, I can't think of anything else. I'm trying to survive. And they don't think about paying taxes and, you know, all the other worries. And so that helps them escape. Um, you know, getting a massage, going to... Like Watson or or Willow Lake or whatever. You, there's so many beautiful places around here. That's why I'm moving here and not tripping on needles and things like that. So uh, uh, puppies, if that makes you happy, reading your Bible, reading whatever religious book you have, you know, doing whatever this guy's doing, hanging out with your friends and dressing up crazy. These are the these are actually people from Rosetta. You could tell these are not the stellar triathletes, right? They weren't stellar triathletes, but they had better mortality than we did. So this is another silly one, but it says ages, uh, patients, adults 65 and over, they did an eight-month intervention. All they did was send them to choir practice once a week. <laughs> and they had decreased doctor's visits, better mood, less loneliness, decreased uh, numbers of doctor's visits. They felt better. 
all they did was go and say, yeah, my brother's a jerk, whatever, you know, they, they just met in the community. That's all they did. Singing is not that much exercise. So, you know, you can't circle the wagons by yourself. It's a lot, little challenging. So it's good to have a group of people that you can do it with. And especially when you're trying to make lifestyle changes. So it's X now, but Twitter, Facebook, those things stress people out. So cognitive behavior therapists, sometimes antidepressants help some people, but that would be a last resort. And then fixing the gut microbiome. And then laughter, this is the last point is laughter lowers all those stress hormones, just laughing, having a good time. Yeah, we have times you laugh and you go, man, I felt so good. That was so great just to laugh and like going to breathe. Uh, it makes a huge difference. It does the same effect as exercise and all of these other things we're looking at. You know, Proverbs says a, a cheerful heart's a, a good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries the bones. So you don't want osteoporosis too on top of it. But, and then again, he said, look, if you're going through a hard time, surround yourself with people. That's the best thing you could do. So tons of data on this increases vascular, you know, decreases cardiac risk, all these things. It's just, it's just beating a dead horse. So the important thing is at, we're all getting older. I just want to tell you, this is a story that just recently happened. I have a podcast on life's best medicine talking about this. There's a guy in, in Arizona actually who has a, a, a nursing home, a group home for people with advanced dementia, Parkinson's. His name's Hal Cranmer. It's called paradise for parents. And this is a guy who came to him and he kind of reached out on, on Twitter and said, I don't know what to do with this guy. He's sitting like this, 90 degrees, can't interact, doesn't talk, nonverbal. We're trying to, and he eats like, and the crazy thing is, and two studies have recently come out saying this, people with dementia, and he said this a year ago when I interviewed him, he said, Brian, when these guys come into my, my house, they'll put six packets of sugar in their coffee. They eat sugar. All, if you give them sugar and anything else, they're getting sugar. If there's candy, they eat it. Right, right. So this poor guy, he de he declined very quickly with 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 uh, Parkinson's and dementia, and his wife put him into a standard nursing home. Within three weeks, he was in this condition, and she goes, "I can't take it anymore. He's gonna die." So she found this guy Hal and said, "See what you can do." So we put him on Health Code, who's sponsored by podcast. I said, "Can you guys send him some food and see if we can get this guy?" They put him on that higher fat diet with with avocados and his shakes and all that kind of stuff because he's craving sweets. You give him something sweet, um, but it's not sugar, right? So. That was him. Three weeks later, I just want to show you this quick. Hopefully, I can get this to play. What play? Oh, there he is. Here he is. Less than a month later, this guy who was comatose, he needed two people to get him out of the car. Now he's playing with his, his uh, great-granddaughter, right? Crazy, crazy stuff. The only intervention? Well, he had several interventions. They did red light therapy. He did sauna with these guys. He did engagement with them. But having this guy sitting like that all day? He was going to die. There's no question in my mind. That's why I stopped going to nursing homes a long time ago because I couldn't take it. But now when you have a guy like this, you go, man, there's hope for us because sooner or later, you know, we may need this. And if he can do this, he prevents him from going to a higher level of care by three to five years. You don't want to spend all your money on that end of life stuff. You want to just die one day and say, I had a great time, right? And so this is just community. These are people I know, Sean Baker and some of the, the people in this community. There's a movie I would recommend called Fat Fiction. I was actually in it with some of my patients about four years ago. Uh, and it's, it's amazing to see these people come off insulin and diabetes meds and all that kind of stuff. And that's Ben Bickman. That, that was the day I actually, I met him at the gym that we had that conversation he goes, you're going to kill yourself. And there's a group of my ladies that I took care of in Vacaville. Um, they're, they're all farm immigrants, like didn't speak English. And they go, the owner of the company said, look, I need help with these ladies. They're all going to die. They're all sick all the time. They're diabetic. And so we did a 16 week program and we put them on low carb ketogenic diet we got them to do group exercises together and we met with them over Zoom. And the reason that I love this picture is this was them uh, towards the end of us meeting and they were showing me all the cookies. And I go, why are you guys showing me the cookies? And they said, look, before those would have been gone in 10 minutes. Those, someone brought those, they sat there all day. This is the end of the day, no one ate them. Only the other coworkers who weren't on their, this program ate it, the rest of them. But I said, how do I know? How do I know you didn't eat any? And they go, we have our continuous glucose monitor. Look at it. That was their lie detector. They knew that they didn't do it, right? So anyways, it's kind of cool when you see stuff like that. So these are some of my references here. And so uh, I think you guys survived it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So um, if we want to do a little Q&A, if anybody has any questions, if you come up to the microphone. Question. So... Um, I saw your interview with Lisa Cook. It was from 2020. She wrote Keto East. Yeah. Yeah. And you talked about the carb days. Do you remember this? The carb what? Carb days. It's when uh, people who start doing keto have all of a sudden some mental clarity. Oh, yeah. Oh, carb day. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I was thinking you were saying days. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's. 
that is something that, for instance, you know, the, that is a huge point in that when your insulin's high, your cortisol screwed up, you can't think right. You just can't focus. So these guys with dementia and Parkinson, your brain can run on ketones or it can run on sugar. So if you give it sugar, it will run on sugar. If you take away sugar and say you have no choice but to run on ketones, people with dementia and Ben Bickman actually did this. I hate to talk to him about him all night, but he, he's done a lot in this area. They did studies showing that people with dementia and Parkinson's can still run on ketones, even if they can't run on sugar. And so the reason they're eating all the sugar all the time is they're trying to get their brain to work and it's just not working. It just can't run on that fuel. It's like a, a, a Chevy Bolt running on electricity or gas. You can go forever on gas. They can only go a short time on electricity. So yeah, the, these this, these um, this people can get into this thing where they're, they're just like, they don't have this mental clarity. As a matter of fact, just a, as an example, we, a lot of us think ketosis is a last ditch effort for you to survive because you're starving to death. The worst thing that can happen, like people say, well, if you, if you fast all day, you're going to, you, you'll, you'll get weak and tired and you'll, well, the reality is if we were bad hunters and we missed hunting one day and we got weak, we would all die because we would never be able to get strong again. So your body says, look, I'm going to free up energy and I'm going to get your brain sharp and I'm going to get you so they can go kill something. Right. If you go three months without killing something, your brain goes, forget it. <laughs> I can't help you anymore. You're the worst hunter on earth, but you know, you're just going to die. But yeah. So ketosis, when people go into ketosis, they get a mental clarity. And that's why all religions have, have done fasting or, or uh, some type of a ketogenic diet, because they get a mental clarity where they can think clearer. So when people are dying, some of us may have seen that in hospice. It's a well-known phenomenon that people will be out of it for three weeks. And then all of a sudden they'll wake up and go, honey, do this, make sure this bill's paid, call this guy. They recognize their family, and then the next day they die. It just happened to a friend of ours, it, it, you know, one of his mentors. It just happened just like that. So it happens all the time, but the ketones allow your, your brain to give that last-ditch effort to, to try to survive. Okay. So we try real hard to be good, as you know. So how much is too much? One, two glasses of wine a day and a cookie? A cookie yeah. or two glasses of wine? You know, two days a week, a cookie and wine. I mean, how, yeah, that's all of us. That's all of us. That's the thing is like, okay, life has to be livable. There's a great podcast I would recommend. It's called the Huberman lab. And they talked about alcohol and everything. The guy was talking about the effects of alcohol on sleep and stress and all that stuff. And they did studies with COVID actually. And they said, look, if you're stressed at work, go home and have a couple of drinks at night. Right. And see what, how you do then. And the next day they got more stressed. They had more drinks that night. Then the next day they got more stressed and they had more drinks. And then it just got into a disaster and they weren't sleeping because alcohol interferes no matter what it is keto alcohol if it's whatever it is interferes with the sleep cycle as terrible news i don't want to be have to hide behind the podium to say that but that's what it shows so he was asking the guys like okay then so what they did with these people they tapered their alcohol their stress levels got better when they came off of alcohol and it's the exact opposite because we think i'm stressed i need alcohol right or a cookie or whatever it might be so yeah some people are metabolically healthy and can get away with it and there's studies showing that from a metabolic standpoint alone sleep no matter what it gets screwed up with with alcohol there's no question about it. two in the morning people wake up or they don't sleep as deeply um and so they ask the guy i go so you don't drink he goes no i still drink because i enjoy it but i know it screws up my sleep and i'm okay with that because they were saying can you drink at lunchtime once you do this once you only have half a drink you know all that stuff and you try to find something that will work and he goes, it always messes it up, but you got to live your life. He goes, I don't want to live to be 110 and never have a drink with my friends, right? So you have to balance that. So the problem is when you're trying to be good, once you have alcohol, it lowers your inhibition. So you got, you know, so all the time I see people have a few drinks, their sugars actually go down with alcohol with like tequila or something like that. Then all of a sudden their sugars go straight up. A couple will do it. And I'll go, don't tell me. I see the CGM. I know what happened. You went to happy hour with your friends and you go, you know what? screw it. <laughs> We're going to eat cookies tonight. We're going to have order the French fries. We're going to have that. And we'll get back on the bar. So the next morning, the sugars are tank low. They feel bad. They have a hangover and everything's rough, but alcohol lowers our inhibition to make bad choices. Sleep deprivation does the same thing. If you're sleep deprived, you go, you know, what? forget it. I want the cookie. I don't care. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those things of picking out what works for you. Some people are super metabolically healthy. So I have a lady today. I go, you're so metabolic, your insulin, everything's perfect have some carbs, <laughs> relax. Like you're, you're working out tons. Your body needs that energy because I've seen the opposite side of the coin where people are super fanatical. They eat zero carbs and they work out like CrossFit. I have a doctor that, was, that I took care of that in Texas, she consulted me. Her sugars were in 360. I'm like, oh my gosh, this lady's going to be huge. 360, her LDL cholesterol was like 360. So I look at her and she's a fit, you know, super lean. But the thing is, when you work out like that, you have no energy, your body freaks out. So our cortisol was through the roof. We added carbs in, cut back on our exercise, and all of our stuff normalized within two weeks. 
See, it's the opposite for her because she's at the other, most of us are at this end, but she's at that end of the spectrum. So I think it's really knowing where your numbers are, looking at your, your, your triglycerides and HDL and all those things. If they're medical, if you're healthy, then who cares if you have a cookie sometimes, right? These big muscle guys, they go, I eat cookies all the time. Yeah, you have, you know, 90 pounds of muscle on you. All the sugar just goes there. The rest of it, is, it goes to the fat stores because our insulin's high. So these big muscle guys, in, insulin, the reason muscle is the biggest indicator of longevity of all things, smoking, alcohol, anything, muscle mass. Because the more visceral fat you have, it's harder to put on muscle. It inhibits it, right? Because this cortisol effect breaks down muscle. So once you get into that situation where you have a big belly and no muscle, it's hard to overcome that, right? That's why these big muscle guys, you look at them, they, they're huge and they have no visceral fat at all because their muscles eat it all. The muscles inhibit it. And you think about it, and I had to think about this because I have a guy with four pounds of weight loss, he reversed his diabetes from 300 pounds to 300, 320 pounds to 316 pounds. I'm like, this is impossible. He only lost four pounds and he reversed his diabetes impossible. And his wife at the same time lost 28 pounds or something crazy. But what happened is as he lost visceral fat, he put on muscle mass because visceral fat inhibits muscle mass. So I'm thinking, why can that, how can this possibly be? And what was happening? And, and when she said, well, when I hugged him, I couldn't touch my fingers. Now she can grab her wrist. He lost eight inches off his waist with four pounds of weight. That's unheard of. But he was putting on muscle mass, which weighs more than fat, right? So you go, why would that be? If, if I'm saying everything is for our own survival, it's because if you're in a stress mode, like the bears, their cortisol is high before they hibernate. Why? They're putting on tons of visceral fat and getting rid of muscle mass. Because if your bear is Arnold Schwarzenegger with all this muscle, he can't sleep through the winter because the muscle will burn all the fat away, right? So you want to get rid of the, you want to put in as much fat as you can to get rid of muscle. So those of us who are stressed all the time, that's exactly what our body's saying. Oh, you, things are going to go bad. Let's just store fat on you so you'll survive longer, right? <laughs> because if you have more fat and less muscle, you live longer because you're not going to burn through all those calories as quick. Does that make sense? So it's crazy, but that's how the body works. That's why when you're sleep deprived, you lose muscle mass if you're calorie restricted. Because your body goes, we need sugar. I'm going to break your muscle down to make sugar. Well, it would be better if we just broke down fat, <laughs> right? Like, why would you not break down fat? It's there for energy. But when you're in a stress mode all the time, your body is not good at breaking it down. So it jumps to the next source, which is protein, which is not what you want to do. Oh, we have some questions. So my question is, how difficult is it to really stick to a keto diet if you're mainly vegetarian? How do you get those yeah. fats? And yeah. outside of avocados and eggs. Yeah, that's a huge, that's a huge challenge, right? That's a huge challenge. And there's always this, this conflict, like carnivores and vegans, they fight, right? Like you guys should be happy because they'll eat the meat, you eat the bread, everyone's happy, right? But really cutting out processed food, you could be on a vegan diet. The uh, vegan diet, I think, is super hard, right, in my opinion, it's super hard because you can't get a good protein source without a lot of carbs because you're, if you're eating lentils, you get a lot of carbs with that. So if you're metabolically sick, the vegan diet is not going to be the best choice for you. You're going to lose muscle mass. But a vegetarian diet, yeah, you could eat a ton of eggs, right, eggs and cheese and things like that. Um, there's different types of protein that you can have that, that, that can help just really you want to maintain your muscle mass because the worst thing you could do is lose muscle mass in the long run, that is a disaster. So if you're eating eggs, so if I have a vegetarian who eats eggs, it's like, okay, this is easy, right? But how many eggs can you have? But there's things like chaffles that you can do. My wife makes chaffles, they're, they're cheese and egg waffles, right? So you can make that and still stick to a, a veg, if it's for, for, um, for reasons of, uh, you know, religious reasons or reasons of, you know, animal cruelty and all that kind of stuff. You go, okay, I don't wanna eat those kind of things. So even Health Code came out with a vegan option that has a highly absorbable uh, uh, protein that's a fermented pea protein that's fermented. So it's, it works a lot better to absorb into the muscles. And they spent a lot of money to do that, which was a good thing. And all the carnivores are like, Why you, who cares about the vegetarian? Well, we're trying to help as many people as we can, right? So yeah, that's an excellent question. That's the hard part. Because the thing is, a lot of people will see, they'll say, I'm, I'm vegetarian. And you look at their diet, you're like, oh my gosh, like everything they eat is like French fries. And you know I mean? Everything is processed food. So I think we can all agree, let's just get rid of the processed food. And then we follow whatever end of the spectrum. You know, one of my old partners who I'm going to team up with here, she's vegetarian and I'm more on the keto carnivore side, right? So we can coexist, not a problem because some people are going to want to do that. Go, I want to be plant-based mostly and do that. But there's there's good and bad of all those things, you know? And so there's a lot of data out there, but yeah, if you could do protein source like eggs and, and make eggs in every permutation that you can, there's ways to do it. So you're not just eating eggs every day. Cause that's like hard to do, but if you're having a huge omelet with a ton of vegetables in it and you're eating a lot of uh, good, healthy, you know, um, 
sweet potatoes and and uh, and and choosing the right types of fruits like berries are, are lower in carbs. And if you're having Greek yogurt, you know those kind of things, it can definitely be done. But vegan is really really hard. Yeah, it's really really hard. Okay, so this is going to be more a weight loss directed question. Um, I don't want to be that guy where it's like, I've heard of this study, but I don't know the study's name. Mm -hmm. Have you ever, ever heard of Dr. Lane Norton or? Yes. Okay. Not so, a fan, but yes, I know him. I've interviewed him before. Oh, did you? Yeah. Okay. So I know he presented a study before strictly weight loss, where even when insulin levels are elevated, people in a calorie deficit, either carbohydrates or fat, they both lost the same amount of weight. So of course we learned about insulin and all the other effects it has on the body, but from a purely weight loss perspective, would you say that if somebody's not able to lose weight, it has less to do with their high insulin level specifically? And it's said more with all the other factors that may go on with a person who has high insulin. Like no, that, that, that say you're referring to was done by Dr. Hall has been debunked. Oh. There's been a lot of stuff talking about because if you're on a cat, you can, if you're on a calorie restricted, higher carb diet, Yes, you can lose weight, but your insulin comes down. It comes down because you don't need that. If you're not, if you're eating 500 calories a day, you're in a calorie deficit. So by definition, you're going to lose weight. But the problem is these studies, the other problem is, okay, you lose weight, but it ones if 70% of your weight loss is muscle mass. That is not sustainable. When they say it's not sustainable, you go, okay, if I can maintain muscle mass and lose weight and make your body more lean and who cares about the scale? And, and that's, and I'll just bring it up since it's a it's a topic is the ozempics and manjaro you shoot up and you lose 40 pounds 50 pounds 70 percent of that weight loss is muscle mass you know i'm showing those balloons what happens when those balloons get really full you can't oxidize them very well so it's hard to lose weight right so what manjaro does and says uh, and and ozempic is it having two big overfilled let's just call them like storage units your storage units are full okay Let's just make eight more storage units. Then we'll make 10 more storage units. And then we'll take these out and we can oxidize it. So if you can oxidize it, you can lose weight. The problem is now you have 300 storage units. And when you start, you keep eating the same way, you're going to gain weight plus some. And that's what the data is showing. You lose weight, but you look at two years and they're above where they started. $1,800 a month you're paying. 70% of the weight loss was muscle mass. Now you lost your metabolic rate. And now your weight's, you're, you're in that bad situation of the, the bear hibernating, right? So that there's a lot of data out there. And... There are diets. There was one that was called like the rice diet where they put them just on rice and they lost weight. But they look at these people who just stopped eating because you're like just eating rice all every day. And they go keto, carnivore, that's too restrictive, but you're going to eat rice the rest of your life, right? Anything. If I say you're going to eat broccoli only or steak only, at some point you go, forget it, right? You want to have this, this kind of, because so human nature pops into it. And a lot of those studies are just, they're studying mice. Right. If you put a mouse on a steak diet, they're going to die. You put a lion on a vegan diet, they're going to die. Like they, they, that's not species specific of what you need. Right. So I think the big thing is looking and saying, are you going to maintain your muscle mass? You're going to lose the visceral fat. Are you going to bring down your insulin and, and, and look at those markers? So weight loss, no matter what, um, if you fast, for instance, your LDL will triple in three days, double at least. So because your body's burning fat as a fuel source, so that's going to be in your bloodstream because you're kicking it out of the fat stores and now you're using it. That's why that, that doctor who had no fat stores for cortisol was through the roof because their body's like, where am I going to get my energy from? Most of us don't have to worry about that. I wish I had that problem. But, you know, trying to get to that point is, 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 is the thing. So I think bottom line and, and Hall, that same guy who did the study, they showed that if you eat uh, processed food, you're going to eat way more calories. So if you eat real food, I, even like we see it in Italy and Europe, people are eating pasta and they don't get, they don't gain weight and they're not getting these sugar spikes, but this huge processing that we're doing. So there's a guy, Robert Lustig, who's, who's the head of, um, uh, you know who he is. Yeah. So, you know, he's done a lot of data on, you know, looking, it's like the biggest indicator of obesity and diabetes was sugary drinks and juice. That is the biggest disaster. So if we could just cut that out, you're going to do better. I was pre-diabetic and gained a ton of weight doing juice, juice fasting. I was eating juices, I'm green drinks. I'm like, what the heck is that? I mean, like kale and spinach and I'm gaining weight and my sugars are high. How is that possible? Well, I'm kidding, because it tastes terrible. You put grape juice and orange juice and stuff in there, right? And then you have Melba toast and then you have you know, whole wheat toast and your sugars go crazy. So it depends on where you're at. Like someone like Lane Norton, my argument with on his side is he's, deal he's not dealing with the people that I'm seeing that are morbidly obese diabetics who are metabolic. He's looking at these big muscle guys and he goes, What's his big thing? They can have, uh, uh, what's like the, 
Pop-Tarts. My guys eat Pop-Tarts all the time. Yeah, they eat it and it goes to their muscle and they burn off. They're lifting for three hours a day. Like the accountant sitting on his desk does not have that luxury. I can guarantee you that. So that's the problem is when they start looking at these studies, they're not li they're looking at weight loss, but it's like, how, what's the percentage of muscle mass? Lean muscle mass is the key. Yeah, so there's, there's, some, uh, you, there's some things where you, you're not looking at all the science and you have to look at it in its predominance and try to say, okay, what's sustainable? Because what's sustainable for you may not be sustainable for someone else, right? So you just figure out, if you hate meat, then carnivore is not your option. <laughs> if you hate vegetables, like Sean Baker, who's the head of the carnivores, I interviewed him, I go, Sean, how come you don't eat fruit? He goes, I get fat and diabetic when I get, eat fruit. And this guy's six foot seven, all muscle, right? He's only steak. And I'm like, this guy's crazy. But he got a coronary calcium zero, no, no disease in his coronary. He's 57 years old. He's not going to develop in, in, in the next year or two. And so I want to eat vegetables. I don't like them. Okay. But he doesn't eat all the processed garbage food and he's doing fine. Like the guy just broke the indoor rowing championship of the world, you know, that kind of stuff. So he's a super fit athlete. So he get away with more than most of us can. So yeah, it's trying to find that balance for us, whatever works. But calorie restriction, you're always, you know, it's like saying, if I'm, you know, this is the problem. If you, if you spend more than you make, you go bankrupt. So all you have to do is save some money and you know, you, you know what I'm saying? So it, 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 this argument is crazy because of course, if you're calorie restricted, you lose weight. But how do you do that is the question. If you're hungry all the time, good luck calorie restricting. If you're eating processed food, it takes a lot. Of, and if you think about it, just from a one standpoint, uh, one bag of Lay's potato chips, family size, right, is about 2,600 calories, last I checked. In order to get that much of ribeye steak, you'd have to have eight eight-ounce ribeye steaks to get that many calories. So who's going to eat eight? You could eat a bag of chips with your buddy and then go out to dinner afterwards. You're not going to eat eight ribeye steaks and then go to dinner. You're going to go, forget it. I'm, like, I'm stuffed, right? No one's going to do that. But with those kind of process, well, that's why we get the calorie thing is so screwed up. But calories do matter. A lot of people in the low carb community say it doesn't matter, but it does matter. It's like, how, but how do you get to that point? But if you're insulin high, I guarantee, because, you know, he's, he's raised that issue with Ben Bickman and Ben Bickman says, I 100% guarantee you if your insulin's low, you look at type one diabetic before they had insulin, they all died of malnutrition. <laughs> you cannot store fat without insulin. You have to have insulin. So if your insulin's at 70, it's going to be a problem. If you're insulin, someone like you whose insulin is normal, it probably doesn't matter if you're eating carbs or fat or protein more. It doesn't matter. But if your insulin's high, for sure, you got to cut the carbs. There's no way out of that situation. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make a correction. I said that Lisa Cook wrote Keto of the East, and that is incorrect. So uh, Lisa Cook is a woman that you interviewed uh, that had gastric bypass. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And she said something really cool. And I just want to do this one last question. She said, you are what you eat, but more accurately, you are what you absorb. So I'm just wondering, um, you've discussed, we've discussed small steps in changing your diet. Um, can you recommend a small step? to begin a metabolic lifestyle change? Yeah, I would say these things, these five things Ben Bickman talked about, I've never seen an exception. I don't know anyone in, that I've ever met in my career or in my life that said, you know, I used to feel so good and then uh, all my stress went away and everything got terrible after that. Like no one says, there's always when stress comes that everything gets screwed up, right? So I think watching the stress and looking at that saying, what can I change, what can I modify? And then I think getting rid of processed food as much as possible, you know, and sugar, because those things make you hungry continually. And there's people who get paid to make us hungrier all the time. So if you're eating real food, you're not going to really binge it as much. And you're not going to get into these kind of cycles where you, have, you can't get full, you know. But if you're eating, you know, you, so the typical person is eating, you know, uh, honey nut Cheerios for breakfast and their sugars go up, then the sugars go up and then they, it comes down. Then they're hungry again. They go, I'm gonna have some chips. Sugars go up, come back down. Now I got to have this. Now you have some. So people who are doing like a low carb diet or a ketogenic diet. They're like, I just like, I eat because everyone's eating. I'm eating dinner with my family, that type of thing. They're not starving all day, like obsessed with food. Right. So I think that's the biggest thing is making small changes that you can do. And if you could say, look, I'm eating eight times a day. Let me cut down to four times a day and see what happens. You know, if I'm eating you know, I'm drinking four glasses of wine a night. Can I cut down to two? Can I just say I'll have a drink on Friday night and not drink all during the week? 
So for me, I gain weight very easily <laughs> drinking wine. So when I come visit my friends here, they go, let's have wine. Let's have, and you go, oh, I want to be social, you know? And so it's hard, but if you go, okay, I'm only drinking on the weekends. I won't drink during the week, right? So then that, at least you're eliminating those days that you can work out and do other things and, and be motivated and stuff. So yeah, it's it's really a balance act. You try to figure out what works for you ultimately. Like some people fast alternately and they do a 36 hour fast here and there and they just burn out their all the stores they have in their liver and then they go do their thing. You know, I've seen crazy stuff. I have a lady... When I first started doing this, she she goes, I looked at her, I, and this is before I really understood this stuff, but she had lost weight. She had lost like 25, 30 pounds. And then she's been like this for five years. I'm like, what the heck did she do? How do you maintain that? Everyone gains their weight back. And she goes, well, I, you're going to get mad at me, but I did keto, low carb, and lost all my weight. And then I said, you know what? I'm not going to eat this way all the time. On the weekends, I'm going to have a drinks and go out to happy hour. So Friday night, happy hour, goes to drinks, does her stuff. Monday, no carbs. She goes, I never gained a pound in five years. <laughs> so she's at a good place. So she could do it. Maybe if I do that, I gain weight and I can't do that. So you kind of figure out what works for you ultimately and go, okay, what can I get rid of? Do I have to have gummy bears to survive? No, you can get rid of that, right? There's certain things that are low hanging fruit and you can go towards the spectrum of more on the vegan or vegetarian side and more on the carnivore side. And people do great on both sides. So instead of fighting with each other, you go, what works for you? Good, right? I, I can't argue with you if it's working, if you're healthy and you're, you're, but if you're having mental problems and you're stressed and depressed and you're breaking your bones, you go, okay, maybe you've got to change tact, right? Thank you. Can you yeah. please help me in thanking Dr. Lenskis? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for coming.